Have you ever fallen in love with a game after only 10 seconds? And I don't even mean after 10 seconds of playing it, I'm talking about after just seeing a game in action, in a trailer or stream or wherever else, and knowing that you'll love it, feeling that it was made for you, figuratively speaking. I'm not really talking about hype here, I'm talking about something a bit more pure. Hype culture is where people attach themselves emotionally to some exciting upcoming game, becoming progressively more emotionally attached and excited as the months roll by, to the point where by the time the game finally comes out, it has become ingrained into their very personality. If the game's great, awesome. If it's not so great or just downright broken on launch, then those people who so eagerly bought into the hype will often either jump off the hype train and perhaps even turn around to throw a rock or two, or just continue riding the train, having journeyed too far to turn back, braving the barrage of projectiles being hurled their way, and perhaps even lobbing a few back, resulting in a big fun mess, about as much of a mess as that metaphor slash analogy was. But as I said, when I talk about falling in love with a game at first sight, I'm not talking about all that, because for the game in question I just knew, I knew that it was for me, and furthermore it had already been out on PC for months by the time I'd even caught wind of it. Folks, the game I'm referring to, the object of my affections, is Darkest Dungeon, obviously, it's right there in the title. And it is, without a doubt, one of my favourite games of all time, top 10 for sure, to the point where I have a combined playtime of about 450 hours on PlayStation and Steam. And that's really not normal for me, because I get bored of most games pretty quickly. But every couple of years some intriguing new indie title will appear on my radar and utterly absorb me, and before I know it I'm a hundred hours deep. A few examples are Slay the Spire, Sunless Sea, The Binding of Isaac, and last but not least, Darkest Dungeon. The game has had quite a history too, being made by the then newly formed Red Hook Studios in Canada Land, with the very studio name being taken from the HP Lovecraft story, The Horror at Red Hook. And of course, the incredible literary works of Lovecraft are the main inspiration for the tone, atmosphere and story of Darkest Dungeon. Although Red Hook Studios would apply for a grant from the Canada Media Fund to aid in the development of their new game, this would end up being denied, forcing them to seek financial assistance elsewhere, which is where Kickstarter came in, raising over $300,000 from nearly 10,000 backers who were intrigued and excited by the singularly striking art style and weighty turn-based combat shown in the Kickstarter trailer. And let's not forget the legendary voiceover contributions of Wayne June, who was involved even back then. A couple of years after the success of the Kickstarter campaign and after many updates and improvements to what was shown in that original trailer, Darkest Dungeon would launch in early access on Steam. Me, myself personally, I had nothing to do with the game at this point, having no interest in PC gaming at the time, no interest in early access, and nor was I even aware of the game's existence, but suffice to say, it would be progressively hammered and grinded into shape over the subsequent year, adding in new hero classes, enemies, locations and mechanics, and taking on player feedback with each fresh update. This period was not without drama, and the Corpse and Hound update in July of 2015, a new gameplay element was added to the game, that being the inclusion of enemy corpses within combat, which would remain on the battlefield after an enemy had been defeated, taking up space and affecting both enemy positioning and the viability of particular attacks from the player's party of heroes, rendering players' previous combat strategies nigh on useless. To anyone who bought the game after its full release, like myself, this controversy sounds ridiculous, because we all think of corpses as being an integral part of the game's combat, because it's all we've ever known, but turns out it really pissed some people off. Despite the small outbreaks of gamer rage here and there, a year after entering early access, Darkest Dungeon would get its official Steam release in January of 2016, and it was around about this point where I started seeing more and more footage of it, featured on channels like Northern Lion and Bear Taffy, and god damn it, did I like what I was seeing. The impactful turn-based combat, the splendiferous in-game commentary from the ancestor, the shadowy tone and maddening atmosphere, the outstanding art style, the grotesque enemy designs, the difficulty, the unpredictability, the progression system, it all spoke to me and I had not even played it yet. And nor would I play it until its release on PlayStation 9 months later. Then, when I finally did get to play the game, guess what? 
It was exactly as awesome as I knew it would be when it first caught my eye many months before, and indeed, my long time appreciation for Darkest Dungeon is why I'm making this retrospective on it. I started this channel to make fun videos about great games, and this is a great game. Before I get stuck right into it, I should mention that I still haven't played Darkest Dungeon 2, and so I'm pretty much oblivious to any story related developments from that game. If I make any statements about the plot which turn out to be not true in the second game, well, you know, sorry. Also, if you find yourself enjoying the video, why not subscribe to the channel for similar content in the near future, and maybe even check out my other retrospectives. And lastly, let me give a warm and grateful thank you to my kind patrons for supporting the channel. Much appreciated, my dudes. And with all that being said, let's begin our expedition into the darkest dungeon. As those haunting opening words of the Ancestor proclaim in the game's opening cutscene, ruin has come to our family. The Ancestor was an influential, intelligent and wealthy man who once resided in a magnificent manor overlooking a nearby unnamed hamlet, as well as other regions of significance, such as the ruins, the cove, the weald, the warrens, the courtyard and the farmstead. Though once a friend and patron to the townsfolk in his younger days, in time, the ancestors' activities and proclivities gradually became more debased, immoral and in many cases downright evil, having all manner of sinister dealings and involvements with the inhabitants of the hamlet and surrounding areas. And throughout the course of the game, the nature and extent of his crimes is gradually fleshed out in increasingly morbid detail. However, regardless of his many immoral and unnatural pursuits and pleasures, it was never enough to satisfy his intense desire for a glimpse into the eldritch truth of the universe. That was until he learned of the existence of a gateway to some unnameable power, a gateway which was rumoured to be situated deep below his own manor's ancient foundations. Using whatever still remained of the family fortune, the ancestor paid workers to excavate below the manor, revealing the existence of the Great Gate, a cyclopean doorway to a new realm of crawling chaos, a realm of flesh, madness and death. The only survivor of the expedition was the ancestor himself, fleeing from the subterranean horror he had sought to unearth before penning a letter to the family heir and marking the wax seal with the family symbol upon a signet ring before loading a single bullet into his pistol and... As for the recipient of the letter, the so-called heir, they make their way to the secluded hamlet via the old road, travelling by horse and carriage, driven by the caretaker, though his long-standing duties seem to have affected him. After the carriage inevitably crashes deep within the twisted thickness of the forest, a crusader and highwayman take care of several nearby bandits before eventually making it to the hamlet, all while the ominous shadow of the derelict manor stands in the background, visible from everywhere and a stark reminder of the unspeakable, unnameable horrors said to lie beneath. The heir, his or herself, isn't revealed as a character at any point in the game in the way the ancestor is, and that's because essentially the player is the heir. Darkest Dungeon is of course a dungeon crawling turn based combat game, but at no point does the heir do any fighting themselves. Instead, would be heroes of all shapes and sizes arrive into the hamlet each week via the stagecoach, eager for glory, loot and any other available pleasures. It's a really interesting and I would say subtle aspect of the game's story, because on the surface it seems like you're controlling the heroes themselves when traversing through the game's dungeons, and you kind of are, but that's because you are represented by the air, present but unseen and unheard. It'd be like playing Uncharted, but instead of Nathan Drake being his own character acting on his own volition, he's actually being directed from point A to B by a different in-game character who is supposed to represent you but who never physically appears or speaks. It makes the frequent commentary of the ancestor make far more sense too, because at first it seems like the commentary is just there to sound really, really cool, but in reality, any time the ancestor makes some dramatic remark impressive, or offers an intriguing insight This squalid hamlet, these corrupted lands, they are yours now, and you are bound to them. He's specifically saying it to the air, though the actual specifics of how he's communicating with us from beyond the grave at all is left eerily ambiguous. When I first heard the way the ancestor remarks on significant in-game actions like crits, kills, hero deaths, traps, etc. A death by inches. 
ambushed by foul invention. A hideous mutation. Unnatural and abhorrent. I reacted the same way I imagine almost every person reacts. I thought, this actor has the sickest voice I have ever heard. It's the kind of voice where the first time you hear it, you immediately perk up, raise your eyebrows inquisitively and say, whoa, 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 what have you got here? What's this then? I like this. Whoa, 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 whoa. Of course, the voice actor in question is Wayne June, who has also narrated the audiobooks for a bunch of HP Lovecraft stories. And it was the game's artist and director, Chris Burasa, who initially contacted June in 2012 to ask him to be the voice of the ancestor because of his Lovecraft work. You can still find a bunch of Lovecraft audiobooks narrated by Wayne June up on YouTube, by the way, and I would definitely encourage folk to check them out. If you like what you hear, you can even pick up a Lovecraft anthology. Most of his stories are only 10 to 30 pages in length, and so they don't take long to finish. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, Darkest Dungeon. The way the ancestor is depicted in the opening cutscene is very cleverly done, because while you do get a brief introduction to his character, it's not quite enough to work out what he's fully about. You do of course get a further feel for his personality from his relentless commentary whilst in the hamlet and in dungeons, but only echoes of it, still not enough to get a sufficient idea of his morality, and you could even be forgiven for assuming that the ancestor might be an unconventional ally of sorts as per his attempts to summon the heir to the manor so as to put an end to whatever horror he encountered below, to right his wrongs. But it's the fragments of lore which precede the game's bosses where his misdeeds while he was alive become revealed to you, bit by bit. In fact, most of the corruption, death and horror afflicting the hamlet and surrounding areas can be directly linked to some past transgression by the ancestor. Take the necromancer for example, the unholy magician lurking in the ruins. The first real dungeon expedition you embark on is in the ruins, and as quickly becomes apparent, the place is absolutely overrun with skeletons, both big and small, and the reason for this is the necromancer. But the reason for the necromancer is the ancestor who invited a delegation of alchemical experts to the manor only to poison them in their sleep before bringing them back to life with most of their intellect still intact. And the result was the necromancer, an unholy devil whose sole remaining purpose is necromancy. Thus, it's not even a case where the skeletons down here were an accident brought about by the ancestor's reckless actions, but rather this was all done intentionally, all to further his own ego and arcane knowledge. Another example is the story of the brigands and their dreadful cannon. Although the ancestor was once well liked and respected throughout the hamlet, there came a time when the townspeople became increasingly weary of his immoral and criminal ways, to the point where they rebelled against him, threatening to oust him from his position of power and even have him arrested. As a result, he paid a band of cutthroat brigands to quell the rebellion to let them know who was really in charge, going so far as to slaughter the hamlet's population down to more manageable numbers with the help of their cannon. Thus, for all his charm and intelligence, the ancestor was intensely immoral, thinking absolutely nothing of culling a few dozen townsfolk or tapping into forbidden mystical arts for the sheer morbid thrill of it. And these are just two examples. There are a ton more in the base game and the DLC. For as much Lovecraft influence as there is in the game, there's also a wee bit of Hellraiser there too. The way the ancestor had to keep chasing after ever more intense and forbidden pleasures at the expense of his morality before finally encountering a hidden world of horror reminds me a lot of Frank from the first Hellraiser movie, or the book, whichever you prefer. That's about as much as I'll say about the ancestor for now, but there are further darker revelations about this twisted character further down the line. The whole reason the heir is here in the first place is to embark on an expedition into the titular darkest dungeon, the same dimension which drove his ancestor to madness, so as to face and perhaps defeat whatever lurks within. But to do that, a powerful, fearsome team of heroes is needed, and lots of them. And at the start of the game, you do not have a lot of them, and nor are they remotely as powerful as they need to be. Darkest Dungeon is essentially a long campaign where you as the heir and carefully selected teams of heroes venture into dungeons within the four base game regions and two DLC regions, taking on enemies and bosses, collecting trinkets, gold and heirlooms, all towards upgrading the capabilities of the Hamlet so as to strengthen your roster of heroes up until the point where they're sufficiently prepared to delve deep below the manor and enter the Darkest Dungeon. Interestingly, you're free to venture into the Darkest Dungeon very early on if you really want. 
In fact, before the Weald, the Cove and the Warren regions are even unlocked, you can say screw it and go right in. The game doesn't try to stop you, and who knows, if you think you've got what it takes, go right in, I'm sure it'll go fine. Another life wasted. Survival is a tenuous proposition in this sprawling tomb. No, it won't go fine, because among many things, this game is about preparation, and I mean that on different levels too. In one sense, nearly everything you do throughout your campaign goes towards preparing for the darkest dungeon. There are of course a variety of twisted and horrific bosses to fight, each with their own interesting backstories and associated rewards for victory, but narratively they aren't why you're here, they're coincidental, mere opportunities to grow stronger, and as such they are completely optional. The goal is the darkest dungeon, but the problem is that it's really, really difficult. In fact, it's by far the most challenging region in the game, even taking the two DLCs into account. While I did show off what happens if you're foolhardy enough to attempt the dungeon with low level characters, the idea is that even though you can attempt it, you'll be far too intimidated to even try, and rightfully so. You're shown a glimpse of the fleshy, multi-eyed monstrosity emerging from the entrance in the opening cutscene, and you see the level recommendation of Darkest on the map screen, along with the warning to beware the shuffling horror, and you go, no, maybe in another 50 to 80 hours, but not now. So that's the long preparation element, but preparation also massively comes into play with individual dungeons, to the extent that the decisions you make before a mission even starts plays a serious part in determining your chance of victory once you actually get in the dungeon. That's not to say your fate is always sealed if you badly prepare beforehand, but poor decisions can heavily tilt the odds against you, just as smart decisions will give you the upper hand. The kinds of decisions I'm referring to are your chosen party composition, the resolve level of your heroes, the current stress level of your heroes, their positive and negative quirks, their trinket setups, your choice of supplies and provisions, and more. There are many elements to take into consideration, and this is all fine for someone like me with hundreds of hours in the game, but it's significantly more challenging for someone who's brand new to Darkest Dungeon with no knowledge and understanding of the systems, stats and mechanics, let alone the idiosyncrasies of each region and optimal party compositions. When I'm preparing for a medium length mission to the Cove, I'm thinking, okay, shield breaker up front for our armour piercing because the enemies in the Cove have high prot. Stick an abomination in row 2 for his stuns and blights, because while the enemies have high resistance to bleed here, they're vulnerable to blight. Bang an occultist in row 3 for his massive heals, but also for his bonus damage to eldritch type enemies. The enemies in the cove are mostly eldritch, and if you put him in row 3 instead of 4, he can make use of sacrificial dagger too. And in the back row, I'll have my arbalist for a great debuff and damage output, and she can also assist with the occultist's heals with her battlefield bandage, while the occultist can assist her with marks from his vulnerability hex skill. Oh, and let's make sure to bring anywhere from 16 to 18 food, 3 to 4 shovels, a couple of medicinal herbs, a bandage or two in case we get an arterial pinch from a yucca, blah blah blah, you get the point. There's a lot of preparation, consideration and rumination before embarking right into any expedition. Because if you don't prepare, then the already stiff challenge posed by the dungeons, monsters, bosses and general RPG can seem insurmountable and hopeless, which I'm sure is how many new players of the game do feel, especially when you take the stress mechanic into account, not to mention the permadeath feature. But as you slowly start to figure out what the hell you're doing and how the hell everything actually works and how to appropriately prepare for particular dungeons at particular regions, you realise, hey, Maybe this game isn't as brutal and punishing as people make it out to be. Perhaps as long as I take sufficient consideration before delving into any dungeon, I'll be okay. Despondence set the stage for heroism or cowardice. More dust. Another life wasted in the pursuit of glory and gold. No, never be sure that you'll be okay in Darkest Dungeon. You can work to mitigate the risk, but there is always risk. With the lower level dungeons, you can mitigate that risk significantly, but at the highest level, the champion level, you can only mitigate it so much. 
there is always an element of danger, of things spiralling out of control, even if you seem to be in complete control just one or two battles ago. And sometimes, when this happens, there's just nothing you can do about it. But that's what makes Darkest Dungeon, Darkest Dungeon. And speaking of dungeons, let's talk about how they operate. Although a decent portion of the player's time will be spent looking at various stat and upgrade screens within the Hamlet, the majority of their time will be spent out on expeditions into dungeons. The first taste of gameplay is when the stagecoach crashes on the old road, forcing you to walk ahead and encountering the first couple of battles, which although easy, can still go horribly wrong. This has happened to me before on an ill-fated Stygian difficulty run, where I lost my highwayman after receiving a couple of unlucky crits and a bleed. This small excursion isn't really here to brutalise or intimidate the player though, much. It's here to give you a taste of what the gameplay actually is. And indeed, this is essentially it, complete with a chest reward at the end which happens to be a guaranteed trap, just to let you know what kind of a game you're getting yourself into. Darkest Dungeon is entirely 2D, and the dungeons themselves are grid based, being composed of rooms which transition into hallways. Rooms can contain battles, bosses, treasure, curios or quest items, whereas hallways can also contain battles, bosses, treasure, curios or quest items, but also traps, hooray for traps. No actual traversal is done within rooms, they're just static screens to be transitioned into either from the beginning or at the end of a hallway. Well, the hallways are where you're actually moving through the dungeons, exploring them and delving further into both the known and unknown. As far as actual movement goes, what I've just described is pretty much it. This isn't a game with any sort of focus on fast reaction gameplay, but rather strategy, preparation and smart decision making. Of course, there is much, much more to the dungeons than just that, like scouting, torchlight and hunger checks, but the actual means of traversing through them is kept very simple, though minor elements of traversal are added here or there, such as in the Crimson Court DLC where coloured keys are added not to mention a much greater focus on backtracking, because that's fun. Whilst the Color of Madness DLC scrapped traversal entirely for its farmstead region in favour of never-ending waves of monsters. The actual meat of the dungeons and the game as a whole is of course the combat, that wonderfully satisfying turn-based combat, but aside from that, a variety of curiosities, obstacles and secrets are littered through each dungeon. And the nature of these differs from region to region. As I said, you have the ruins, the warrens, the cove and the weald, and as well as the many hostile inhabitants of these four regions being very different in appearance and nature from each other, even the curios and hazards differ. Curios are the name given to the many, many interactable features dotted throughout hallways at random, and they take a variety of interesting forms. For example, in the ruins, you could come across a confession booth, iron maiden or decorative urn, or in the warrens, a rack of blades, pile of bones or occult scrawlings. Then in the cove, you can find curios like eerie coral, a fish carcass or giant oyster, while in the weald there are mummified remains, shallow graves and old trees. These are just a few by the way, there are loads more, some of which are specific to particular regions, while others can be found near anywhere, like crates, treasure chests and discarded packs. The purpose of these curios differs widely too, with some being there purely for profit, while others are there to help you survive, though as with most things in Darkest Dungeon, there is often risk, and again, the level of risk associated with each curio can be affected by your level of preparation beforehand, with the risk and nature of many curio interactions differing depending on whether you have a hero touch it with their bare hands or with a specific item. For example, sacks are about the simplest curio you can find. No special items are required to activate the true potential of the sack, and you can simply have a hero interact with it without the help of an item, with there being a 75% chance to find some gold, or a 25% chance to find nothing at all. Hey, I like those odds. Good deal. I'll take that wager. Business is a gamble. But then you have a stack of books, another common curio, and all of a sudden, things get way more complicated and mathematical. Now you have either a 22% chance to accumulate stress on the hero who interacted with it, a 22% chance to receive a random positive quirk, an 11% chance to receive a random negative quirk, a chance for the light level of your torch to be decreased, or you could find a random journal entry, or you could find absolutely nothing of interest. So do you bother interacting with it? Well, that depends. How far into the dungeon are you? 
What are the current stress levels of your heroes? Do you think it's worth the risk to maybe get a random positive quirk when you could also get a negative one? And what if you do get a positive quirk, but it's not as good as the one it replaces? In the case of curios like this, it's all up in the air. It's pure chance, and so personally I almost never bother interacting with them at all. Then you have curios like the Eerie Coral, which, similarly to the stack of books, carries an inherent risk if interacted with, but if you bought a spare medicinal herb or two beforehand, now you have a guaranteed positive interaction with the coral, removing a random negative quirk from a hero of your choice, an act which would normally cost you around 10,000 gold back at the hamlet. Same deal with the confession booth and the ruins, you have a 50% chance to accumulate stress from a regular interaction, but if you brought along a holy water, now you have a guaranteed way to heal stress instead. Although not every curio has a special interaction with an item, most actually do, and the rewards can be lucrative in some cases, or life-saving in others. In fact, some curios even have multiple different interactions with varying results, like the locked sarcophagus or display cabinet, which can be cracked open with a shovel for a decent reward, or opened more delicately with a skeleton key for an even greater reward. Of course, you're not always going to have the corresponding item to maximise your reward or guarantee a positive interaction, meaning that any time you encounter a given curio in a hallway, you need to weigh up whether it's worth interacting with at all. Bear in mind that almost all items have multiple uses, both inside and outside of combat. If you see an old tree in the wield, sure you can use an anti-venom to protect against the poisonous sap, allowing for a thorough search, but anti-venom also cures poison, or blight as it's known in this game, and there happens to be a lot of enemies who can inflict you with blight in the wield. Is it worth using an anti-venom for a curio interaction when the reward might not even be that great? Again, that depends on how close you are to the end of the dungeon, and perhaps whether you have an alternate method of curing blight, but ultimately, it's up to whether you want to risk it or not. There is a constant balance of risk and reward in Darkest Dungeon, and where you fall on that spectrum of risk should depend on your current situation in that dungeon, and perhaps even your larger situation in your campaign. You can play things relatively safe, or you can be a bit more reckless in pursuit of greater rewards, but like I said, you're never truly safe in this game, no matter how much you know or how well you're prepared, so taking that extra bit of risk can go a long way. Of course, I'm talking about all these interesting interactions as if it's just a case of stocking up on the corresponding items before a dungeon and then reaping the rewards, but bear in mind that the game doesn't actually tell you which items work on which curios at all. And furthermore, if you take a chance and use the wrong item, well the best case scenario is that nothing happens and you lose that item forever. Great. But the worst case scenario is you get a very misfortunate interaction, like if you try and use a torch on a stack of books. Sometimes it'll be fairly intuitive to work out what sort of item can be used on a specific curio, but then other times it's really, really not. For example, I just gave the example of a very bad outcome from using a torch on a stack of books, but if you use a torch on a pile of scrolls, you get a great outcome. So stack of books, bad, pile of scrolls, good, gotcha. But why though? Before writing up this retrospective, I'd actually never looked at the wiki before, and I'd always just went by trial and error when figuring out all the interactions, gradually memorising most of them, and then usually forgetting them, and then memorising them again on a subsequent playthrough. Now, I do think this is the most adventurous and rewarding way to go about the game, though at the same time, yes, simply looking up all the interactions on the wiki helps massively, especially for the courtyard region. I literally only learned on this latest playthrough that you can use holy waters on the blood fountains for a stress heal, and for ages I had no idea what the hell you were supposed to do with the blood flowers before discovering that you're just supposed to smash them open with a shovel, and it only took me about 450 hours to work this out. Yeah, on second thoughts, maybe just use the wiki. Thus, for as simple as the traversal is at its core, the experience of moving through a dungeon is thoroughly flavoured by the wide variety of weird and wonderful curios, but bear in mind that the main reason for interacting with a lot of them in the first place, and our main reason for even delving through many dungeons, is for the rewards. See, any expedition requires funding for provisions and supplies, and of course, to undertake an expedition, you need a team of heroes. The skills of these heroes need to be sufficiently honed at the guild, and they also have to be armed with the best equipment from the blacksmith, but this costs gold, 
and lots of it. But before you can go spending exorbitant amounts of money on tougher breastplates, sharper long swords, and faster crossbows, the Hamlet's many dedicated buildings and facilities must first be sufficiently upgraded, and this requires additional resources known as heirlooms, specifically busts, portraits, deeds, and crests. While you will find a lot of gold, precious gems and expensive antiques within dungeons, you also come across many heirlooms, requiring additional space in your already cramped inventory, and inventory management is yet another important aspect of the game, again tying into the ever-present element of risk versus reward. When you first enter a dungeon, you have no valuables or heirlooms, but a pack full of provisions and supplies, because you need things like shovels to clear obstacles without the unpleasant stress and health penalty that comes from clearing them with your team's bare hands, and food to ensure you can pass the game's partially random hunger checks without the unpleasant stress and health penalty that comes from being a bit hungry. But then, what happens when you're just a few hallways into a dungeon with a full inventory? You win a battle, and you find six crests, two portraits, a piece of onyx, and a partridge in a pear tree. Well, now you have to have a serious think about what you need to keep, what you should probably keep, and whether it's worth discarding those two bandages you'd been saving for some heirlooms and a piece of loot. The inventory space is just right too, any less and it would be irritating, and any more and it would lessen how engaging the inventory management is to a level where you wouldn't really need to think about it so hard, because while 16 spaces seems like plenty, it's really not when you take all the different item types into consideration and their capacity to stack. I mean, leaving heirlooms aside for a minute, the main currency in the game is gold, and indeed you find plenty of gold after battles and from curio interactions, but you also find citrine, jade, onyx, emeralds, sapphires, rubies, jute tapestries, puzzling trepsahedrons, minor antiques and rare antiques, all of which are simply other forms of gold but which take up their own spaces in your inventory and which cannot cross stack. Thus, while you'll frequently be faced with decisions like do I throw away my last four food for a piece of onyx, or a shovel for a bust? You might also have to think about whether to throw away a half stack of gold for an emerald, because a full stack of emeralds is worth over twice that of a full stack of gold, but then you might not find a full stack of emeralds, you might just find the one throughout the whole dungeon. I know I'm getting quite specific, and frankly nerdy with my example there, but gold, even small amounts of it, can really, really matter, depending on your current financial situation and your campaign, and your finances can fluctuate alarmingly quickly at times, especially if you spend the last of your gold to fund some fresh expedition into a dungeon only for it to go horribly wrong, forcing you to flee the dungeon with no reward and a party full of thoroughly disturbed heroes. And by the way, it's not a case of if that'll happen, it's a case of when. Gold is always essential, but even so, you might get to a point where you have a pretty comfortable stack of it and want to focus more on acquiring deeds to upgrade the stagecoach or blacksmith, or portraits to upgrade the guild or tavern, or crests which act as a secondary resource requirement to upgrade nearly anything in the hamlet. You're rarely ever going to have enough of everything, both within and without dungeons, and smart prioritisation depending on the situation is key. Now that I've thoroughly beat around the bush with my talk of resource management, assorted dungeon curiosities, and whatever the hell else I was ranting about, I think it's high time I spoke about the actual combat, the central component which everything else in the game merely serves, that intense activity where the demand for important decision making becomes intensified, where heroes are either made or vanquished. Combat in Darkest Dungeon is of course entirely turn based, and is initiated either when stepping into a combat tile in a hallway, or into a combat room in a… room. These aren't random encounters like in many other turn based RPGs either, but nor do you have any idea of what the hell it is you're going to be fighting when entering a combat room. I mean I say they're not random, which is true in that the locations of combat encounters are determined upon entering a dungeon, but that doesn't always mean you'll know when a fight is coming, with the degree to which the layout and contents of any dungeon are revealed to you being dependent on whether you get a scout at the beginning of a dungeon or when stepping into any new room, filling the rudimentary map at the bottom right with detail of the whereabouts of nearby battles, traps, curios and even bosses, allowing you to either face any hazards and fights head on, or choose to take an alternate path round. Although there are countless variables which differ from one combat encounter to another, there are also some constants, some rules. 
For one, there can never be more than four combatants at either side of the battle, either on your side with your heroes, or the enemy's side with their four skeletons, fishmen, swine folk, or mushroom boys. Stages of combat are divided into rounds, and all of your heroes are guaranteed a turn every round. Yes, they may get stunned, cancelling out their chance at performing a skill, but that still counts as a turn even if it's not good for anything. The same is mostly true for enemies, except some larger, tougher beasts actually get two turns, and certain very tough bosses are allowed three turns per round, posing extraordinary difficulty, but also damage dealing opportunity for your team from bleeds or blights. There is a speed stat, but even if you have a speed of 20, and the enemy has a speed of negative 5, which is a thing in this game, some stats can go negative. All that means is that you're extremely likely to get a turn before them, but they will still get the same number of turns as you. This differs a lot from a game like FF10, but if you get your agility stat high enough, you can get 15 turns for every one the enemy gets. If you're wondering why I'm comparing Darkest Dungeon to Final Fantasy X, uh, I don't know either. I just like FF10. Unlike FF10 and I guess most turn based games, there aren't really any regular attacks in Darkest Dungeon. There are only skills, with each hero having 7 in total of which only 4 can be equipped at one time, though these can be swapped around outside of battle, so long as other skills have been unlocked and or upgraded at the guild back in the hamlet. When you get your first taste of some simple combat after the stagecoach crashes on the old road at the start, you might initially assume that the game does actually have a range of basic, conventional attacks to thoughtlessly fall back on as you nail a brigand or two with an overhead sword cleave from the crusader or a slice of the dagger by the highwayman, because these skills do seem rather vanilla. But this isn't quite the case. Combat skills are all situational, with restrictions on which rows they can and can't be performed from and which enemy rows they can target. For example, although the Crusader's Smite seems like the kind of default sword attack you'd find in near any turn-based RPG, it's only useful or indeed usable if your hero is in row 1 or 2, to the point where you can't use it at all in rows 3 or 4. Furthermore, as with every skill, it has its own accuracy and crit modifiers, as well as a damage bonus, specifically to unholy type enemies. So, what do you do if your crusader gets pushed to rows 3 or 4 in a battle? Well, you use a different skill, one appropriate for the situation, according to its own specific range and stat modifiers, perhaps a holy lance, or maybe take the opportunity to throw out an inspiring cry for a small heal. Or maybe you didn't account for the crusader being chucked to the back of the bus, and now you have to slowly move him forward, taking up a valuable turn each time. This is why it's important to think hard about which four combat skills you select for a hero, and why you may want to even switch to a different four skills depending on your chosen party composition, which region you're visiting, or which boss you're facing. For example, I don't normally use the occultist's weakening curse, but when I do, it's when I'm going up against the fulminating prophet in the ruins, then you bet I'm bringing an occultist along and equipping that skill, because I know it can trivialise that otherwise very dangerous boss. With each of the game's 15 different classes having 7 different skills to choose from, this means they all have at least some degree of versatility. However, their capacity for versatility at different positions in the team's formation within any given battle varies significantly from class to class. One of the most versatile classes is without a doubt the Shieldbreaker, who, while being capable of unleashing devastating multi-target attacks from row 1, can also strike out viciously from rows 3 or 4. Thus, if my Shieldbreaker is hit with an Eldritch Push, Ball and Chain or Tidal Slam and falls all the way to the back of the formation, it's not the end of the world. I can easily recover from it with powerful attacks which also move her closer to row 1, where she's arguably at her deadliest. But then you have a class like the Leper, the most hit or miss hero in the game, and I mean that literally, he misses all the bloody time, though when he does hit, he hits hard. But even aside from his tendency to whiff attacks, making me absolutely furious every time, the Leper is not a versatile character at all. Whereas heroes like the Shieldbreaker, Jester and Grave Robber all have efficient skills to adapt to or recover from severe disruptions to party formation, the Leper does not, being nearly useless from the back row and being slow as hell to move back to the front. The main point I'm trying to make is that different classes have very different strengths for different situations, and the balancing in this game is so finely tuned that every class has its place, it just depends on where you're taking them and who you're going to be fighting. 
That doesn't mean that your playtime with every class is going to be about equal by the end of the campaign, or even that you need to make use of them all, but they do all have their uses. Some classes are applicable pretty much anywhere, like the Vestal, with her unique and massively effective ability to group heal, or the Mana Arms, with its powerful buffs and ability to guard and repost, useful skills in any region. But then, you have the Flagellant, who is a goddamn bleed machine, being capable of attacking the back row with Reign of Sorrows, or the front with Punish, or a Sanguinate, all of which deals huge damage over time. For the Warrens, the Courtyard and the Wield, the Flagellant is one of the best classes you can bring, thanks to how vulnerable the enemies in those regions are to bleed, but he's really not suitable for the Ruins due to the complete resistance to bleed which Skeletons and Gargoyles have, and nor is he a smart choice for the Cove because of their high resistance, but not immunity, to bleed. You can take him to these places and successfully complete an expedition, but he would almost never be part of an ideal party comp in such an expedition. He's who you would bring if there was no one else available. Then you have the Plague Doctor, who is pretty much the same as the Flagellant, except instead of Bleed, she's a Blight powerhouse, ideal for the Ruins and the Cove, but significantly less useful in the Weald, the Warrens and the Courtyard to some extent. When you first play the game, you have no idea who you should take where, but after a while of playing, experimenting, then analysing every class's strengths and weaknesses, you gradually develop a good idea of the best team for each region, and this process is very satisfying. Or you could just say screw it and go for quad lepers in every dungeon. As if it needed saying, to defeat any enemy in combat, the goal is to deplete their HP, obviously but I do feel the need to point it out a little bit more with Darkest Dungeon than I would with most other games, because while your main goal as far as offence is to nail all opposing health bars, things actually work a wee bit differently insofar as defence is concerned, and that's where several of the game's signature elements intersect both beautifully and brutally in giving it the notorious, unforgivable reputation that it has so correctly earned since its first release nearly 9 years ago, and those elements are stress, the death is door mechanic, and permadeath. See, in most RPGs, turn based or otherwise, your characters have health. Low on HP? No problemo, use a potion or sleep at an inn or whatever the hell else, and you're good to go. It's as if you'd never take any damage at all, and there are no medium to long term effects. In Darkest Dungeon though, not only do you have HP to keep topped up, but you also have to manage stress. Of course, HP as a concept is easy enough to understand on both a mechanical and thematic level in any game. It's the level of damage done to your character, a number to represent the remaining health, applicable for most games. But Darkest Dungeon isn't most games. Your party of heroes aren't venturing into some cartoon cave populated by goblins, gremlins, grumpkins or snarks, or rather, they are descending into dark, hellish environments, crawling with half-human horrors, eldritch abominations, gibbering madmen and countless other cruel, terrifying and monstrous creatures eager to rend, lacerate and devour the flesh of each and every foolhardy hero who invades their rancid deathly dens. The world of Darkest Dungeon is incredibly dark and cruel, to the point where there's very little warmth or kindness to be found, at least not here in this distant corner of the world. Every aspect of the art style radiates with the dark ooze of shadow, madness and mistrust. Even the very logo, seen absolutely everywhere throughout the game, is alarming. A black ring of spikes pointed inward toward the flame, and metaphorically, your team of heroes are the flame, even being represented as such on the map screen in every dungeon, and those black spikes are the monsters, traps, curios, bosses, blockages and even the darkness itself, nearly all of which have the ability to damage, bleed or blight your heroes, but also cause stress. See, while any damage inflicted on your party does get fully healed up after each dungeon, any stress accrued does not. There are many ways stress can be built up, both inside and outside of combat. Some things that will happen because you took an unnecessary risk and touched something you shouldn't have, but most of the time it's just as unavoidable as damage, and often just as frustrating, if not more so. Your heroes will take stress from walking in the darkness, getting caught in traps, getting hit with a crit from a different hero being critted, from getting hit by the variety of attacks purely there to build up stress like stress wave, stressful incantation and vomit, from walking backwards through a hallway, just turn around, from some negative curio interactions and then you have the various nasty debuffs, 
quirks and town events there to increase the percentage of stress dealt to all your heroes. It's all very overwhelming, it's all very stressful. So what's the deal with stress anyway? What does it do? What's the big idea? Well, regardless of a hero's resolve level or HP number, their stress level will always initially be somewhere between 0 and 99. And regardless of where they fall within that range, most of the time it will make no difference to their stats or behaviour. Though there are some trinkets and quirks which only activate upon a hero's stress passing a certain threshold. Often a hero will even start with a portion of their stress meter already built up a bit. This happens when you bring a lower level hero to a higher level dungeon and is one of the several reasons why it's generally not a great idea to do that unless absolutely necessary. Once a hero's stress reaches 100 however, they get a virtue check, resulting in them either becoming afflicted or pulling through with a clutch virtue. And the whole affliction thing is why you want to keep your stress levels as low as possible. I spoke about the darkness of the game's world and how twisted and maddening everything is, but another element to all this is control, or rather, the lack of it. You cannot control everything that goes down in any given dungeon, especially on champion level dungeons. Your attacks will miss, sometimes when you really need them to hit, and enemy attacks will crit, often when you really need them to miss, and there is nothing you could do about it. Mitigation and preparation, sure, that much you can do, but you can never fully be in control, and you never truly have a handle on things, no matter how confident you are. It all goes back to that oft-quoted line by the Ancestor. Overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer. It's a cool line, but it's also completely true here. No matter how well you prepare, or how confident you are that you know your enemy, sometimes bad things will happen, causing the situation to utterly spiral out of control, and stress is a big part of that, especially when your heroes start becoming afflicted. An afflicted hero will get big stat debuffs, lowered max HP, can refuse to eat food or follow your commands, can mess with your carefully considered party formation, and most significantly of all, they will stress the hell out of your other heroes and themselves, leading to others becoming afflicted, accelerating the downward spiral into madness, frustration, and perhaps even death. This can all happen infuriatingly quickly too, sometimes on the first or second battle of a dungeon, regardless of how healthy and carefree your heroes were upon entering, because some enemies have a very obnoxious habit of specifically targeting the hero with the highest stress level, meaning that you can have situations like this, where you have three fighters who are clear of mind while the other is on the verge of a nervous breakdown, and there is often very little you can do about it. Of course, there is always the chance of a virtue instead of an affliction, though the chances of this are just 25%, which is the way it should be. Though as with many things in Darkest Dungeon, there are potential modifiers to improve these numbers with trinkets, quirks and town events. One of the most relieving and empowering things that can happen when playing really is a virtue occurrence, because chances are you won't get one, and they only happen when things are going badly and your stress is reaching critical levels, which is probably when you need a virtue most, cancelling out a massive chunk of stress and effectively functioning the opposite way to an affliction, providing stress relief, buffs and heals for your other heroes depending on the nature of the virtue. Also, as with pretty much everything in the game, the audio visual aspect really adds to how exciting it is to get lucky with one. With those two seconds of building anticipation ending in a triumphant crescendo of white light, and just as one nasty affliction can lead to you failing an entire dungeon, one shining virtue can save it. Adversity can foster hope and resilience. But we haven't quite talked about death yet, which is another thing Darkest Dungeon does rather uniquely, and of course ties back to stress, which can also lead to death. Numbers in this game are all kept quite modest, for the most part. There are no monsters with millions of HP, or extravagant multi-hit attacks doing 99,999 damage per hit, but rather the HP of your various heroes will tend to range from 20 to perhaps 70 with the number varying from class to class, as well as with trinkets equipped and upgrades to armour. The Jester is the most vulnerable HP-wise, while the Leper and Man-at-Arms are about the closest thing the game has to tanks, 
Not that anything is particularly tanky in this game. The same is partially true for enemies, though there are many exceptions, particularly in regions like the Cove and the Weald where you'll find many monsters with high prot stats, negating percentages of your damage output, and then bosses can have HP in the hundreds. I think the numbers were generally kept low to emphasise the fragility and vulnerability of everything, and that although tough, your heroes are not superhuman, though some of them do call upon certain otherworldly forces to aid them in battle. As a result, it really doesn't take much to have someone's HP go from this to this. In fact, it's entirely possible for a hero to lose all their health from a single hit. This is not uncommon in champion dungeons when hit with a nasty crit, and crits can get very, very nasty, trust me. For as much as it sucks to have such fragile heroes, the catch is that they can never die simply from losing their HP, instead entering a status called Death's Door. And this is where things get very tense and very scary, because any damage from absolutely anything, even from a bleed or blight, can result in a death blow, and there is no coming back from a death blow. When a hero is gone, they're gone. It doesn't matter how many hours you've spent building them from level 0 to level 6, spending many tens of thousands of gold upgrading their skills, weapons and armour, perhaps even giving them an affectionate name, they're gone, and the game makes no apologies for it. It will happen too, just as damage and stress is unavoidable, so is death, because you can never fully be in control. You can enter into a dungeon, get into your first battle, the enemy gets a turn and crits your hero down to death's door, and then a different enemy hits them for a death blow. Now that's a particularly unlucky example, but it has happened to me before, and on a champion dungeon no less, and there's nothing you can do about it other than to try not to scream into the closest pillow. Stress also ties into all this because although you have your initial meter extending from 0 to 99, once you get afflicted, now your hero is on their next meter going from 100 to 200 and reaching 200 puts them straight at death's door with a chance to have a heart attack, killing them outright. Of course, all this really does is serve to make the game profoundly thrilling because it means that your actions really matter. Yes, a lot of it is down to RNG, there's a lot of RNG in Darkest Dungeon, it's everywhere. But at the same time, the game is almost always very open about the actual numbers, going so far as to tell you the percentage chance to hit an enemy, your damage potential, crit chance, all the enemy's resistances, and by extension your chances to inflict a given status effect on them. And then it's on you to assess the data, now we looked at the data. and decide on the best course of action. Maybe you'll hit, maybe you'll miss, maybe you'll land a critical hit and annihilate the enemy in one. Or maybe they'll land a crit on you and take you straight to death's door at the beginning of the battle. Then perhaps you'll survive 5 consecutive follow up hits at death's door. Or maybe you'll get unlucky as hell and lose a hero on the first hit. That's darkest dungeon. The stakes are high but if they weren't, it really wouldn't be so much damn fun would it? Let me also be completely honest though, the RNG can get really annoying. I'm not going to pretend that I clap my hands in delight whenever I miss three times in a row with an attack only to be critted three times in a row by the enemy. In reality, I hate it, though for me one of the most irritating elements on any dungeon is probably traps. Sometimes it can feel like the game is slapping you in the face for even playing it, but nowhere does this feel more true than with traps, particularly when you start a dungeon and get nailed by a trap on the very first hallway tile because you just need to take it on the chin and move on. There's nothing you can do about it. That's the game. I accept the game, but sometimes I also hate the game. That's not true, I don't hate the game, but I certainly experience occasional flashes of intense irritation and frustration, and not just when hit by traps. The game is at its most frustrating when the stakes are their highest, and that's when you're playing on champion level dungeons. There are of course levels of difficulty, as well as levels for your own heroes, but they work a wee bit differently compared to most games. This isn't Pokemon where you have a team you can stick with and develop throughout the whole game, using them for every dungeon. No. God, now I'm in the mood to play Pokemon. But you cannot treat Darkest Dungeon the same way, because there are level restrictions, and these can be a bit of a sore point for some people, to the point where there are mods to remove them entirely. So you have a team of heroes play through a few apprentice level dungeons and maybe even beat a boss, gaining enough XP to take them up to level 3, increasing the resistances and allowing for greater skill and equipment upgrades at the guild and blacksmith. They're a great team. The issue is that you can never use them for another apprentice dungeon, 
unless you get a very rare town event which you might never even see, I didn't get it at all on this playthrough. And not only can levels 3 or 4 heroes not participate in apprentice dungeons, but levels 5 and 6 heroes can't set foot in apprentice or veteran dungeons, necessitating the cycled use of teams from your roster of heroes, making the whole experience rather unconventionally non-linear as far as the difficulty curve is concerned. Because just because you have a few heroes who are capable of going into champion level dungeons, doesn't mean you're done with apprentice or veteran level ones. You might still have a veteran level boss left to beat at a particular region, but have no more level 3 or 4 heroes to fight them with, forcing you to grind up a few lower level heroes just to be able to fight a veteran level boss, even though you have a team of heroes capable of taking on champion dungeons. This really can be a pain in the arse to manage, because sometimes I'd want to use a particular hero for an apprentice or veteran level boss, but that boss wasn't unlocked yet, and so I would need to purposely not use that hero on any other dungeons in case they leveled up more than I wanted them to, which isn't really the most satisfying progression element. I don't quite love the idea of not wanting to level up sometimes, though this is all to encourage the player to use different teams and expand their roster, and try out different party compositions. Of course, the stress aspect also discourages you from sticking with the same team, as well as other elements such as quirks and diseases. The Hamlet has various ways to get rid of stress with the Tavern and Abbey, with a specific method chosen depending on the hero's quirks and how well you've upgraded a given facility with heirlooms, but engaging in these activities is not an instant heal. Instead, putting your hero out of commission for a week, or even several weeks if you get very unlucky and they go missing after having one too many pints of Stella at the tavern, or refusing to stop meditating within the transept, forcing you to use alternate party members until the game allows you to use them again. The same is true of curing diseases at the medical ward, and this game has an alarming number of diseases by the way, including but not limited to syphilis, the runs, and the black plague. It's pretty common to take a team of heroes into a dungeon only for them to come out absolutely rife with disease, in the throes of a nervous breakdown and with a set of bothersome new quirks, though whilst disease and stress are of a more overt and serious nature, quirks are a bit more subtle, not being quite as urgent to get fixed up. Quirks are additional stat or behaviour modifiers, and every hero has them, both positive ones and negative, up to five each. New ones can be gained or old ones removed by interacting with certain curios, such as bar reliefs, eerie coral or stacks of books, and sometimes by engaging in stress relief activities in the hamlet. But the most common way a hero's quirks will get changed up is after completing a dungeon, and this is simply inevitable. Thus, when I play, I largely ignore quirks until the end game, because they can be very expensive to treat often aren't a massive deal in the first place, and also that hero is just going to get more quirks the next time they finish a dungeon anyway. That's not to say that they're irrelevant though, because they really can affect how fights or whole expeditions can play out, and you can get particularly bad combinations of them if you're very unlucky. Like here, when my occultist had the gambler quirk, meaning that he'd only participate in the gambling stress relief activity, then he had the bad gambler quirk, meaning that he had an increased chance of losing money whilst gambling, but also the known cheat quirk, meaning that he wasn't allowed in the gambling hall at all. Hmm, I see a problem there. Then there are quirks like Imposter Syndrome, which was added along with the Colour of Madness DLC, adding a 4% chance for your hero to just pass on their turn. Not quite my idea of fun DLC content to be honest. For me, I only start bothering with getting my best quirks locked in and my worst quirks removed when I'm very far into the game and sitting on a mountain of gold, though to be perfectly honest, sometimes I don't quite get that far in in a given playthrough, and nor am I the only one, which is where the grind comes in. The grind, oh Elden grind, it could be something else. See. Although the end game goal is to embark on expeditions into the darkest dungeon before its brain blasting conclusion, that's at the very end. It's not the meat of the game, it's just what it's all building up to, but each of the game's four main regions and the courtyard region from the Crimson Court DLC to some extent also have their own individual measures of progress in the form of bosses. Just as your heroes have their resolve levels, 
going from level 0 Seekers when they're fresh off the stagecoach to level 6 Legends after they've bled, lighted, shot and sliced their way through a sufficient number of dungeons, the regions also have levels and XP, visible on the mission select screen, and when they fill up, a boss becomes available, and then a different boss, and then that first boss again but at veteran difficulty, and so on and so forth for a total of 6 separate boss fights at each region. Though bear in mind that each region does only have two unique bosses, you're literally just fighting that same boss again at higher difficulties, with the only difference being that the veteran and champion variants are more powerful, as you'd expect. You do get a new fragment of lore related to that boss each time you face them though, and the harder variants do also get new names, though the logic of some of the names is a wee bit questionable. I mean you have the Swine Prince, Swine King and Swine God, which makes perfect sense. Same with Necromancer Apprentice, Necromancer and then Necromancer Lord, but then you have the Sodden Crew, Sunken Crew and then Drowned Crew, or the Sonorous Prophet, Fulminating Prophet and then Gibbering Prophet, which all just sounds a bit arbitrary, but nonetheless these are really cool names, especially Formless Flesh. The decision to simply repeat bosses at each difficulty level is undoubtedly questionable though, and does add to the already grindy nature of the game. Even if they'd given the harder variants a palette swap, that alone would have been cool, but they really are identical, apart from higher stats. They don't even get any new attacks. In saying that though, the bosses really are a highlight of the game, serving as puzzles in some cases, and in other cases just being really, really hard, at least until you learn what the hell it is you're supposed to be doing. And if it's your first time facing them, chances are you won't know what you're doing. A perfect example is the Brigand 8 Pounder. You're supposed to take out the Matchman as quickly as possible, otherwise this happens. Or maybe even this. This is no place for the weak or the foolhardy. You don't want that to happen. I didn't want that to happen. I'd just forgotten to reset my party formation before entering the battle like a dumbass. If you know what to expect and come with a team that can reliably hit the back two rows, you're golden. The Hellion's Iron Swan is perfect for this boss, but it's almost like the game wants you to come here and get annihilated first, and then come back with a more appropriate team. Sometimes you will nail a boss first time though, like the Necromancer Apprentice, the first boss most folk are likely to fight, who just isn't all that difficult, and has many vulnerabilities. And then the Sodden Crew is bafflingly easy, regardless of whether it's Apprentice, Veteran or even Champion. And then you have the Sonorous Prophet, who absolutely traumatised me when I first faced him, being the first enemy I'd seen to get 2 turns per round instead of the usual one, not to mention the ability to stun, hit 2 party members at once for ridiculous damage, and inflict damage and blight on your entire team. But if you make smart use of the guard ability from the Man at Arms or Houndmaster, come with high dodge, or better yet, use the Occultist's weakening curse skill, all of a sudden he becomes far less terrifying. Okay, he's still pretty terrifying. Those are his own eyes he's tossing up and down by the way. One of the most hilarious examples of a boss destroying the oblivious first time player however is the Swine Prince, and the game damn well tempts you towards destruction here only to laugh, or should I say squeal in your face after the damage has been done. In the back row of the fight you have a wee prick called Wilbur, and that literally is his name by the way. Wilbur will damage and stun your party, but most dangerously of all, he'll also mark your heroes at which point the Swine Prince will attack them for massive damage with his meat cleaver. It's actually a really similar mechanic to the way the Prophet lets you know who he's going to attack next, except here you can see there's a separate entity responsible, Wilbur, the damn swine, and so you think, clearly I'm supposed to hit Wilbur, only for this to happen. And improvement. breadth from becoming unwound. Yeah, you're not supposed to hit Wilbur, but the game all but signals for you to do that, only to teach you a harsh lesson in caution when you do. As well as your regular area bosses, there are also the roaming bosses, like the thing from the stars, the fanatic, and if you get really unlucky whilst travelling at zero torchlight, you might just run into a shambler, nearly guaranteed to cause chaos to your current expedition. 
Chambord fights can also be initiated at a Chambord's altar of course, but these curios can be very rare, not to mention voluntary, and so you'd better be sure you want to take on this eldritch horror before you place that torch in the altar. Here's what my party looked like before fighting a Chambord, and here's what they looked like after. Here's what this party looked like beforehand, and here's what they looked like after. And the less said about the shuffling horror, the better. But on this most recent playthrough, I had far more frequent encounters with the thing from the stars, though the game does at least give an indication of which region it's currently in on the mission select screen. One of the coolest, most insane designs for a monster I have ever seen, but almost guaranteed to cause extreme damage, stress and perhaps even death, and there are few things more irritating than getting all geared up for a dungeon, paying for a suitable amount of provisions and then encountering the thing from the stars right at the goddamn start, and then having to back out from the dungeon early because of how much it messed up your team. And if you're attacked by one of these roaming bosses with a less than ideal party composition, then good luck not dying. Back to my original point about the greater grind of the campaign though. At first, as you're completing dungeons, the progress bar fills up pretty damn quickly, to the point where you can unlock the right to fight the next boss for that region after just a couple of dungeons. And then, you get to veteran level, and suddenly it's taking a bit longer than it did before. Plus, veteran dungeons are harder than apprentice ones. Plus, bear in mind that you're doing this for all four regions, not to mention combating the Scourge of the Crimson Curse if you have the Crimson Court DLC. And then, after all the veteran bosses are beaten, well now you're at champion level, and filling up that region's progress bar becomes a slow, brutal grind. You're still fighting the same bosses, there are no real surprises anymore, and champion dungeons are hard, can take a while, and can go catastrophically badly. And if things do go pear-shaped, and you need to leave a dungeon early, then no hero or region EXP for you. And if things go melon-shaped, and you lose a level 5 or 6 hero, as will occasionally happen, well that just extends the grind even longer. There are a lot of people who play Darkest Dungeon, really like it, but then just never see the end, because it takes a while, as in 40-80 to 80 hours, depending on your level of experience, and even luck to some extent. Of course, there is Radiant Mode, which reduces the overall grind and even allows for higher level heroes to take part in lower level dungeons, but this mode doesn't just reduce the grind, it also flat out makes the game easier in several ways, which is not the authentic Darkest Dungeon experience that I so crave. Radiant Mode wasn't even there at launch either, and that's true for a bunch of things by the way, including Crit Buffs, Hateful Virago, The Bone Bearer, The Squiffy Ghast, the Swine Skeever, the Stealth Status Effect, the Shrieker Event, the Wolves at the Door Event, the ability to convert heirlooms to other kinds of heirlooms, and probably some other stuff that escapes me at this moment. Furthermore, there have been major balance changes since launch too, drastically affecting the range and effectiveness of many skills, buffing some, nerfing others, and altering some entirely. For example, the Arbalest Suppressing Fire skill used to hit the back 3 rows before getting changed so that it now only hits the back 2. And then you have the Grave Robber's Pick to the Face skill, which was given the Armor Piercing attribute to ignore Prot. Yes, Armor Piercing wasn't even a thing until over a year and a half after the game came out by the way, which made places like the Cove and the Weald a bloody nightmare to get through at champion level. Some buffs were also nerfed somewhat. You used to be able to just spam the Man at Arms bolster ability for massive speed and dodge buffs across your team before they limited it to just one use per battle and even removed the speed buff. There were tons of changes which actually changed the way you play the game, and a much larger focus was given to crits, boosting their frequency and even adding in special class specific crit buffs. In particular, nearly every trinket in the game received a tweak, and although I haven't really discussed them much so far, trinkets are massively important for success and long term progression in Darkest Dungeon. Put simply, trinkets are accessories, a collection of odd accoutrements to be equipped onto your heroes, providing assorted buffs and debuffs. They range in rarity from common to very rare, although you do also get ones which are specific to particular classes, and then there are the special ancestors trinkets which are rewards for defeating shamblers or just by getting really damn lucky. The ancestors trinkets offer particularly excellent buffs, though with an associated plus 10% stress debuff, but a really cool touch is that you can see a few of them in the opening cutscene, such as the signet ring, pistol, scroll and candle. 
There's also the Colour of Madness trinket, only purchasable at the jeweller in the Nomad Wagon, with crystal shards acquired at the farmstead. And there's trophies, which are rewards for defeating the champion versions of each boss, and then perhaps the most powerful category of them all, you have the Crimson Court trinkets, acquirable from within the courtyard and always being part of a set. Trinkets vary widely in effectiveness, and you really do need to think hard about which to equip before any dungeon, though at the start you'll only have a few crappy ones anyway. An interesting aspect to them is that many do not simply give you flat buffs, but are also accompanied by debuffs of varying nature and severity. For example, you have the Eldritch Slayer's Ring, providing a plus 25% damage bonus to Eldritch creatures, super helpful for the Cove and the Wield, but then it also gives you minus 8 dodge. Probably worth it I'd say, especially if it's equipped onto a tankier hero like the Man at Arms, Crusader or Leper. But then you have a trinket like the Dodgy Sheath, which provides plus 8 to dodge, plus 1 to speed, but minus 10 accuracy to ranged skills. Worth it? Well, if you're going to be using ranged skills, probably not. Most trinkets operate this way, with many of the very effective ones often being accompanied by increased stress accumulation, like the head trinkets, and the ancestor ones, but then you have the Crimson Court trinket sets, which if anything are too good, to the point where if I have the corresponding Crimson Court trinket set for a particular class, 9 times out of 10, those are the trinkets I am equipping for near any dungeon. I don't even need to think about it, regardless of the many, many others I can choose. On the one hand, it's really nice to have these powerful buffs, but on the other, it takes away from some of the strategic thinking that should precede any new expedition. Not that it's terribly easy to acquire these trinkets, mind you, and it'll definitely take many tens of hours to get them all, but I'll take a plus 2 to speed, a plus 10 to dodge, plus 10 to accuracy, plus 5% crit chance and a plus 45% virtue chance any day of the week over most anything else. So I guess the crystalline trinkets are where things can get especially weird, interesting and particular. Speaking of DLC content, Darkest Dungeon did of course receive two major content additions in the form of the Crimson Court which introduced the courtyard region and the Colour of Madness which added in the farmstead and then there was also the minor DLC pack bringing in a new hero class in the form of the Shieldbreaker. I love the Shieldbreaker. The ground quakes. Well struck. The decisive pummeling. The Flagellant was also a DLC class, but came packaged with the Crimson Court, same with the Districts. While the activities at the farmstead are very isolated, and can pretty much be ignored if you really want, with no penalty or cost to your larger campaign, the courtyard content is significantly more transformative, to the point where you ignore it at your peril. But before I get into that, I need to talk about something else first. Darkest Dungeon does many things extremely well. It is not a vast game at all, and in fact, it's very repetitive, but nonetheless, it can easily draw you in for tens of hours throughout a campaign, then further tens of hours on future campaigns, and there are many gameplay elements and systems which contribute to its addictiveness, not to mention the distinctive darkness of its art style and the sheer weight of your actions in combat, but I think one of the most significant elements, the thing which ties everything together and gives it all context and meaning, is the incredible writing. Of course, almost all the writing in the game comes in the form of commentary, dialogue and memories from the ancestor, but I've always been enchanted by the colour and density of the game's prose. You're hit with it right off the bat too, in the opening cutscene, and it's like being served a delicious, juicy, well-seasoned steak compared to the dry, overcooked, thin slices of meat offered by most games. I mean, listen to this. In the end, I alone fled laughing and wailing through those blackened arcades of antiquity. Blackened arcades of antiquity. Ugh. Oh. It's like every line has been carefully considered so as to deliver the maximum level of meaning and flavour, and I absolutely love it. Excellent writing is very rare in games, especially in your high production AAA titles which tend towards blandness, sterility and safety over intrigue, flavour and boldness, but when I do find grade A writing, like in Darkest Dungeon or either of the Sunless games, I appreciate the hell out of it. 
The reason I brought up the writing after mentioning the DLCs though was because for as outstanding as it is in the base game, I think it is at its absolute best in the Crimson Court. The Crimson Court is introduced by a much younger ancestor, being centred around the courtyard, an area near the hamlet where lavish, debauched gatherings were held with throngs of pampered nobility and aristocracy, gorging on expensive food and drowning themselves in fine wine. As the lord of the manor, the ancestor himself was the host of these extravagant get-togethers, but despite the presence of nobility, all manner of immorality would take place at these gatherings, involving torture, death and rot, as their morality sank ever deeper into the mud. With the Baron engaging in unspeakable acts of cruelty towards other in front of delighted, excited crowds, while the Viscount gleefully dined on piles of rotting food, and later, people. By far the most notable visitor to the courtyard, however, was the Countess, a woman of singularly enchanting beauty, but by this point the ancestor's own morality had been dispensed with, thanks to his involvement and participation in the evils of the libertines and aristocrats who frequented his parties. And so he decided he would end the Countess's life in a crimson display of public cruelty. However, this was no ordinary woman, with her glamorous countenance concealing her monstrous inner predatory self. Regardless, the ancestor's dagger did indeed strike home, and as if murder wasn't enough, he harvested and bottled her blood only to serve it to his vulgar guests, even revealing its morbid origin to them beforehand, evoking only laughter and delight. However, right after drinking the blood of the Countess, the tittering guests transformed into vile, half-insect monstrosities, tearing at themselves and each other in a frenzied display of madness and mutilation. Luckily, the ancestor himself had only consumed a single drop, and so instead of transformation, he received only eldritch insight, giving him his first nugget of knowledge of the existence of the darkest dungeon, setting him on the path which would later conclude in him locating and opening the Cyclopean portal beneath his own family's historic manor. And thus, all activities in the courtyard involve fighting the army of transformed bloodsuckers and the aforementioned Baron, Viscount and ultimately the now resurrected Countess. The catch with this DLC is the Crimson Curse, an infection which drives its victims to an intense craving for what's known only as the blood, stored in distinctive bottles throughout the courtyard, and it's this curse that changes the way you have to play the campaign. See, for the first few weeks you won't really notice anything out of the ordinary in the Hamlet, regardless of whether you venture into the courtyard or not, but the longer you leave it without doing anything, the infestation level grows, and the higher it gets, the more bloodsuckers you'll see in other dungeons, in both hallways and even room battles. The more battles you get in with these enemies, the higher the chance that you'll have heroes infected with the Crimson Curse. At first, you'll have one or two heroes infected, pretty easy to manage, but after a good few weeks of not dealing with it, most of your roster can end up with the curse, even from using stress relief activities back in the Hamlet, making it unavoidable in the medium to long term. There are a couple of reasons why you don't want this to happen. 1. Cursed heroes need blood to survive, and 2. Cursed heroes are unpredictable as hell in battle. See, although the curse gets passed on to your heroes in much the same manner as disease, in practice it's like getting an affliction, except with perks. With the exception of the flagellant, being afflicted is always bad. Your hero gets big debuffs, they spread stress, they won't heed your commands, and it's generally just a big pain in the anus. The exact same is true of cursed heroes, particularly if they're craving the blood, or worse yet, wasting. But if you feed a craving hero a bottle of the blood, their status changes to bloodlust, and this comes with major buffs to damage, speed and blight and stun resistance, which is awesome, except when this happens. Perched at the very precipice of oblivion. You don't want things like that to happen, and similarly obnoxious behaviour is also seen with heroes who are craving the blood. It's trouble. Yes, there are benefits, but it's more bother than it's worth, adding an additional element of unpredictability to a game already rife with RNG. And if you're heading out with an entire party of cursed heroes, well multiply the headache by four, and you'd best bring a lot of the blood along with you too, because if you really push it and deny someone the blood for too long, they can straight up die, 
And this is also true if you leave a wasting hero back at the hamlet without a sufficient stockpile of the blood. So how do you cure someone of the Crimson Curse? Well, short of the use of a very rare item from the fanatic roaming boss who you might never even see, the main way to cure the curse is to defeat the current courtyard boss. First the Baron at veteran level, then the Viscount at champion level, and then finally the Countess at darkest level. But if only it were that straightforward. Here's a typical map layout for a boss dungeon in the Warrens. And here's one for the Ruins. Now here's the map layout for the Baron's dungeon, and then the Viscounts, and then the Countesses. These maps are ridiculously long, to the extent that they will almost certainly take multiple expeditions to complete, even if you know exactly where you're going. Though a couple of mercies with them is that they are not randomised, and you can leave and later return to the same spot where you left. It's not necessarily the size alone that's the issue with these, it's the backtracking. You just don't know what you're going to find if you follow a branching path. Will you find an optional key leading to a crocodilian? Will you find a key you need for the main boss? Or a trinket? Or a secret room? Or a curio? Or is it just a dead end? You'd better check because if you pass by it and later realise that you're missing a key you need, have fun backtracking all that way, getting into more hallway battles, running out of food and gradually going through your stores of blood until the point where your health is too low, your stress is too high and your resources are too depleted to carry on, forcing you to back out of the dungeon. Meanwhile, everyone's still afflicted with the curse and it's spreading fast. This is a stressful game already, but the courtyard adds yet another delicious element of franticness, because it's effectively a race against time. But when you finally reach the boss and take them out, the sense of relief is incredible, as your entire roster is completely cured of the curse, allowing you to breathe again and carry on with your usual business, at least until the infestation level starts to rise once more. As you might be able to tell from the way I'm speaking about the Crimson Court, I love it. It profoundly changes the way you play your campaign, and the story and bosses are incredible, but I don't love it completely. For one, you are likely to get absolutely sick of fighting bloodsucker type enemies. They are of course what you fight nearly exclusively in the courtyard, but it can get really tiresome seeing them everywhere else too. Don't get me wrong, as enemies they're fantastic, with grotesque designs and interesting moves, but their appeal does start to wear off somewhat after a certain number of weeks of constantly seeing them. Furthermore, the dungeons are too damn long, and bear in mind that you will exclusively be fighting bloodsuckers in them. These battles can be crazy hard too, but in particular, the crocodilians are one of the few enemies in the game I think might be slightly too hard. I've got two words for you. Apex Predator. My final critique with the DLC, although it is a somewhat minor one, is that the whole blood management element can be nearly eliminated simply by purchasing the Sanguine Vintners District, producing two bottles of the blood each week. Two bottles doesn't sound like all that much, but it means that after you beat a courtyard boss and everyone's cured of the curse, your blood will carry on building up, so that by the time the next infestation comes round, you don't need to worry about it anywhere near as much, thanks to your massive stockpile that's been accumulating every week. All in all though, the Crimson Core is awesome. In fact, it's one of the best DLCs I've ever played, and the quality of writing is a huge part of that. As for the Colour of Madness, it's a fair bit different to the Crimson Court and much smaller in scope, though with its own distinctive elements of intrigue being concerned primarily with the stars rather than the blood, with its aesthetic, enemies and region being characterised by that astral glintstone green. Rather than being a properly new region, the farmstead is all about fighting waves of enemies, bosses and accumulating crystal shards along the way. The farmstead does have its own story, with the ancestor taking advantage of the poor miller's misfortune after a bad harvest, offering to help but instead erecting slabs etched with celestial designs around the perimeter of the farmstead in hopes of summoning the attention of some unnameable thing from the stars. And that is exactly what happened when a comet struck the farmstead, transforming the surrounding area into a crystalline anomaly of otherworldly corruption where the logic of the world ceases to be relevant and where even the very constellations of the stars stop making sense. The story associated with the DLC is very cool, and I do love the cosmic flavour of it all, but it's clear that story wasn't quite as much of a focus as with the Crimson Court, and there aren't even any new cutscenes. 
The main focus is on the endless harvest, a never ending rush of enemies and with the new enemy type too, husks. The remains of the workers, beasts of burden and even scarecrows who once worked the miller's land, although you also encounter nearly every other enemy in the game too with the unique light colour mechanic. You always start off fighting husk after husk, however the light will then change colour applying specific buffs and debuffs to both you and the enemy team, summoning monsters from a specific region until that wave ends before your party is given a brief respite with the chance to heal or pick up shards used to purchase powerful crystalline trinkets from the jeweller. The farmstead is all about endurance, requiring reliable heals and stress management, instantly making certain classes more desirable than others like the Vestal and the Jester, and I think this is probably its biggest shortcoming. Being an enemy wave type mode, it would be nice if there was a bit more of a focus on rewarding experimentation with your most highly leveled up heroes with all their best quirks locked in, but a jester is nearly a damn requirement, to the point where you are at a severe disadvantage if you don't bring one along, although some folks do also use the Houndmaster's Cry Havoc skill. Personally, I've got very little experience of using that particular skill. Not sure if most people play Darkest Dungeon the same way as me, but I'll tend to focus on just 4 or maybe 5 skills for any class and then just stick to those and then <laughs> barely experiment with the others. Like for the Flagellant, I always use Punish, Reign of Sorrows, Redeem and Exsanguinate. And then for the Vestal, it's Judgment, Divine Comfort, Divine Grace and Dazzling Light. In fact, I don't think I've ever used Mace Bash or Hand of Light. Maybe I should, I don't know. Back to the colour of madness though, I'll be honest, I'm no expert on it, and it's never really taken up a massive amount of my time from playthrough to playthrough. It's a really fun diversion to spend half an hour to an hour on between the base game stuff and the Crimson Court, and I love the inclusion of the crystalline trinkets, but the farmstead has never been that much of a focus for me, especially because a good half of its contents is just recycled enemies from other regions, whereas I'd rather just play those actual regions and fight the bosses there. But now that I've covered all the main elements that go into the game as well as its DLC, I would like to talk about the darkest dungeon itself, the antediluvian dimension of madness, death and cosmic truth. There are four expeditions in total, each having different purposes and levels of threat. In the first dungeon, things are ancient and brutal with vast crags and pillars visible along the red horizon and bloodstained metal ornamentation in the foreground, but the deeper you go into the dungeon, the more alien and eldritch everything becomes, with mod tentacular agglomerations of ambiguous pink flesh adorning the environment in the second expedition, before the third expedition, the very walls and halls are made of living, writhing flesh, as if your team were navigating through the shifting innards of some impossibly vast planetary being, because perhaps they are. An awesome thing about the Darkest Dungeon is that all the enemies here are unique. A few of them are more difficult variants of enemies already seen earlier, like the Cultists and the Shuffling Horror, but even these have notably different designs and are significantly more difficult, with new attacks, not to mention being stressful, very, very stressful. These final encounters are some of the most difficult in the game, even the regular hallway battles, and while conditions can spiral out of control in your champion level dungeons, this is doubly true of the darkest dungeon, and these expeditions aren't designed for you to get to the end unscathed. The idea is that you need to use your best heroes, most powerful trinkets, and apply all the knowledge you've learned thus far to hopefully come out on top. It's generally agreed by most players that the second dungeon is the hardest, and seeing as how it took me three attempts at it before I won, I'm inclined to agree, and defeat is particularly painful in the darkest dungeon, because if you try to leave, a random hero dies. It's not an RNG thing either, one of your heroes, your precious level 6 heroes, will die, and so if you lose someone in a battle as I did, and then want to escape back to the hamlet to recover, You've actually lost two heroes, and that really, really sucks. A uniquely difficult aspect of the second dungeon is that you're given these three special trinkets called Talismans of the Flame, and these are needed to protect against a particularly nasty attack called Revelation, because if you get hit by it whilst not wearing the trinket, you're going to have a bad time. The nasty thing about that is that it means you have one less trinket slot available and that you'll have one hero who does not have a talisman, making them totally vulnerable to the attack. Though for whatever reason, after I failed the dungeon for a second time, I looked at my inventory and saw that the game had given me an additional talisman. 
I'm not sure if that's a bug or what, but I'm not one for looking a gift horse in the mouth. The third expedition is one of the most unique dungeons in the game, and can range from being one of the easiest expeditions if you get lucky, or the hardest if you get very, very unlucky. There's just one objective here, and that is to reach and activate a special curio called the Locus Beacon. The issue is that the map is absolutely massive, and the beacon's location is completely randomised. Thus, you might find it in one of the first rooms you enter, ending the ordeal in about 5 minutes, or it might take you an hour, or you could simply run out of firewood, torches and food and never find it, forcing you to back out of the dungeon and lose yet another level 6 hero. And to make everything just that little bit more infuriating, there are monsters here who can literally teleport you to a random point in the dungeon, and there's nothing you could really do about it. Even if you kill these white cell stock creatures, the mammoth cysts will simply summon another. I love how utterly alien everything is in this dungeon though, and how you're past the point of anything appearing remotely recognisable and human. It's as if the enemies are a part of the environment itself, emerging from the walls or ceiling and attacking the invading bodies like an immune system. After the Locust Beacon has been located and activated, there are no more actual dungeons to fight through. Instead, after stepping through the portal into a haze of shifting violet nebulas, for the first time we come face to face with the Ancestor, or at least his avatar. Here he explains in his usual darkly sparkling prose of the significance of the glimpse of cosmic truth he'd seen within the darkest dungeon, at that moment ceasing to be a human, instead embracing the hideous eldritch reality of the world and even helping accelerate its moment of explosive criticality which is precisely why the air was brought here in the first place. You still foolishly consider yourself an entity separate from the whole. I know better. And I will show you. That, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the coolest lines of dialogue ever, and it initiates the multi-phased boss battle with the Ancestor. Despite the brutal challenge posed by the Darkest Dungeon expeditions, mercifully the final bosses really aren't all that difficult, thank god. At first, the Ancestor can only be damaged by defeating his imperfect reflections, bizarre clones tainted with that familiar pink flesh, before summoning flashing sprites of absolute nothingness, blasting the party with damage, bleed and stress. Upon the Ancestor's defeat, a livid pink heart is revealed, and though it does have a couple of attacks of its own, it's mainly meant as a tension builder, a precursor to the emergence of the gestating god resting within, ulcerated arms outstretched in perverse deific glory. This is also the first time in the game where the camera pans back somewhat, increasing the drama of this final encounter. Again, really not a particularly difficult boss compared to what's came before, but a catch is that you are almost guaranteed to lose a hero, and perhaps even as many as three, depending on how slow you are to deplete the boss's health. It even makes you choose who it kills, making it all even more painful. I'd almost prefer it if it was randomised, to be honest. Unfortunately, any glory which comes after beating the boss is profoundly short-lived as the ending cutscene plays, revealing the true scale of the god you may have thought you'd just dispatched, because there is no defeating this threat. The flesh is everything and the flesh is undying, and the cloak of sanity and normalcy covering the world and its inhabitants merely conceals the undeniable truth lying just beneath the surface. The reason the air was called to the hamlet and ultimately the darkest dungeon was to feed this god with death, to accelerate its hideous emergence from the beating heart. The ancestors saw a glimpse of the truth and immediately understood the futility and impossibility of resisting, instead choosing to lure family heirs to the hamlet to unknowingly partake in this ritual, and even if the result was the temporary defeat of the Heart of Darkness, it was irrelevant. As the final cutscene shows, this all seems to be part of some inescapable cycle, with the next cycle being initiated by those familiar words, Ruin has come to our family. It's not clear whether the Hamlet is caught in some space-time anomaly, but the same air relives these events repeatedly until the ritual is satisfied, or if alternate heirs are called to the Hamlet following the empty success of the previous one. But either way, the fate of the Hamlet, the planet, and perhaps the cosmos is sealed as the clock ticks down 
to the day where the very earth shatters open, revealing the unknowable, unnameable entity within. Like I said in the introduction, Darkest Dungeon stole my damn heart after just 10 seconds of me even seeing the game. The vast majority of games released every week on Steam and console hold absolutely no interest for me, and this seems to get more true every year. I'm not sure if it's due to me getting older, or if games are just getting worse, or if it's a combination of the two, but in any case, I don't take it for granted when something special comes along, and Darkest Dungeon is one of the few games I consider truly special. Its deep, interconnected systems, gritty art style, fascinating themes, singularly stupendous voice acting, stellar writing and unforgiving difficulty draw me in every time I play, and before I know it, I'm playing for hours every night, utterly absorbed in furthering my campaign, weighing up every exploration and combat decision and developing my roster of heroes before taking on the game's most brutal challenges. There's a very good reason I have a good 450 hours in Darkest Dungeon. It's because it's one of the most compelling games I've ever played. That doesn't mean that it's one of the best games ever made, or that it's perfect, because it's not, but it sure as hell does a lot of things very, very well. As for Darkest Dungeon 2, don't know, haven't played it. I had a lot of mixed opinions when it first released in early access, and then just never got around to picking it up when it finally released. That might seem a bit weird considering how much I love the first game, and to be honest, yeah, that is weird. I don't really have an explanation, but I'll give it a shot at some point. And on that mystifying note, I think it's about time to conclude this retrospective before I talk any more nonsense. Let me give another fond thank you to my kind patrons for their generous support, and as always, cheers for watching and cheerio.